Hi, uh, it's uh, Jason from the Centre for Computing History and I am here today uh, with the wonderful Steve Ferber. Um, normally it would be Professor Steve Ferber, um, but today he's the wonderful Steve Ferber because he is uh, donating uh, to the museum uh, a couple of very, very important machines um, in terms of the history of the BBC Micro in terms of Steve's history. Steve, thank you very much um, for having us here today. You're um, very welcome, Jason. And um, yeah, so tell us what, um, what you're very, very kindly donating. Starting with this machine over here. Well, I'm donating several boxes full of junk, but, um, <coughs> which my wife is very pleased about. Um, but uh, principally, I've got a couple of um, old computers. Uh, this one um, is the first computer I built. Uh, it's um, you know the history is is, is quite well known. Um, a bunch of enthusiasts at Cambridge University who liked building computers for fun f formed this student society called the Cambridge University Processor Group mm -hmm. and I wasn't one of the founders um, but I was interested so I joined in and having joined in uh, thought I'd better build a computer to qualify for this um, and, 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 and so this was the first machine I built and it, it, it's, it's here with its original front panel um, which after some time got displaced by a much more boring one um, but what you can see here is it's got a set of switches these eight switches here you set up the data and then you can write it in. Uh, you can also load an address in, but actually it will automatically increment the address. So you can put successive bytes in by setting them up on the switches, mm -hmm. uh, load a program in and then set it running. Um, the processor that I used in this uh, was a Signetix 2650. Um, mm -hmm. The card frame is something I built myself. I couldn't afford a commercial card frame at that stage. Um, so I got some angle aluminium from a local hardware store, um, a few commercial card rails to put the cards in, and then built a back plane, which in this case is made out of uh, the Paxlin Vera board, um, using the standard DIN 41612 connectors, which are 2 by 32 pins. Mm -hmm. So 32 uh, signals were connected directly down the back plane. The other 32 pins were available to make other random connections such as interrupts and so on. Right. Yep. Um, and the, the technology used for uh, building the cards was uh, Vero wire, um, which uh, you can see quite a lot of, uh, which is one of the more interesting boards. I can't remember which one it was now. Um, so that's the processor board. You can see uh, some of the chips have been plundered for subsequent work, um, <laughs> but this has the Signetics 2650 on, which is an 8-bit micro that, that not many people can remember. No, it um, wasn't that popular. <clears throat> it was not very popular. It was uh, not a big success for Signetics. Uh, who do, you, do you know why? Is, from, from you working with it, can you anything that you noticed about it that made it not as good as the other chips at the time? Not, not particularly. I mean, the, 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 I don't remember all the details mm. of it, but one feature I do remember is it had a hardware stack. Uh, on the chip, right. and, and, and so you could make subroutine calls and, and it would store the return addresses on the chip. Hmm. And I think it had a, 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 you know, a fixed depth because it was in hardware, probably order eight, eight, yeah, yeah. eight deep, um, which would be a limitation for, for general software use, but of course for um, embedded control. Um, it's actually quite a nice feature, really. You could work with that, yeah, yeah. hardware stacks, good yeah. feature in general. Um, there's an EEPROM on this, that, that came later. I, I developed a sort of a one kilobyte operating system, entered through the switches, but you get bored of entering things through the switches. I could save the stuff to audio cassette and reload it, so I didn't have to enter everything every time, but when I was happy with the operating system, I built a PROM blower card, which I think was used exactly once, uh, worked first time, <laughs> um, and was never, never used again. I think that's, that's also in here. I'm trying to identify, that, that, that's, that's it. Um, uh, these connectors are quite firm. Uh, yeah. Um, they make good connection. But you see that, that that's the prom oh, blower, yeah. yep. the zero insertion force socket. Lots of individual transistors because there were some funny voltages yeah, on these yeah, EEPROMs. Yeah, stick 21 volt on the, the uh, program pin and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the basic chip used plus 12, plus minus 5. Mm. And then for programming you needed a higher voltage which these transistors would control into mm -hmm. it. As I say, I think this board was used exactly once, worked <laughs> first time, um, and was never used again. Um, it illustrates the the basic technology on all of these boards is, is very wire, so 
with very wire you have these um, uh, combs that you glue to the back of the standard prototyping board. It's, it's a single Eurocard mm -hmm. Vera board. You push these in and then the wire is, is, is quite fine wire with, uh, with some kind of um, polyurethane yeah. coating yeah, yeah. which melts when you solder it. Mm -hmm. Apparently giving off fairly noxious vapors Absolutely. as well, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I've inhaled lots of that. Um, That's good. So you, you, you basically got a socket poking through the board, you wrap the wire around a pin of the socket, you solder it, that makes the connection, and then you thread it round these combs, trying to keep it fairly tidy. Um, it is pretty tidy. Until you get to the other end, wrap it round, solder it again, and you can put lots of wires down the same combs, they don't short because yeah. the insulation only gets broken when you melt it. You can see mm -hmm. a sort of bit of a knot of wiring. At that point, uh, more substantial things, such as power supplies, would be fed through, um, not through the Vero wire, it's a bit too fine, so yeah. you can see there also, this, this is wire wrap wire, um, which is glued, super glued onto the back of the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, more current. there may be various hacks on the front, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's, that's the, the basic technology um, that was used in this first machine. And in some sense, this first machine was, used to bootstrap Acorn. Okay. Um, so when Acorn did its first commercial contract, which was developing a microprocessor-based fruit machine controller for a company in Wales, Ace, was that the right name? I don't sure. know, I know it's a company in Wales, I don't know the name. Yeah. Um, we, we designed um, a dual processor system. <laughs> <laughs> it's embarrassing to think about it. Uh, uh, using National Semiconductor SCMP processors. Yep. Uh, but we basically use this as, as a terminal okay. through a serial line in, in, to develop that and debug it. So in some oh. sense, the whole Acorn business was bootstrapped from <laughs> this pile of, of hand-built stuff. So how long did you think that took you to build? Well, uh, I think to get something going was a few months, but you can see it, it's had lots it's of extensions extended, yeah, yeah. and it's had lots of bits plundered for other things. Um, yep. so, um, so it's a bit hard to define its actual state. Mm. Um, yeah, it's that, that initial one from coming up. I mean, and also, why? I mean, so you, you're the, the, the Cambridge Processor Group, but was it just to... Well, is it initiation ceremony or something? Did you have to bring a, uh, a machine to be part of the group? Or was well, it, it showing off? Or was it actual, um, you know, I, I don't know. What, what was the reason you would go about building this at that time? So, so, so there, were, there were various reasons. My, my primary personal motivation was, was I've always had a, an enthusiasm for flying. You know, I did model aeroplanes and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd begun to realise, you know, I, I, in my second year, I think I joined the Cambridge University Glider Club, but you know, I, I went for a year of Wednesday afternoons out to Duxford, and in that year I amassed 54 flying minutes on 14 separate flights, oh, right. and realised this was a rather inefficient uh, use of time. So I thought, well, maybe you know, you could build some kind of flight simulator, um, oh. and it was really that that idea that you know, if I understood a bit more about computers, I was using them a bit. I was a fluid dynamicist at the time. My, my PhD is in fluid dynamics. Uh -huh. And I had a research, I was Rolls-Royce Research Fellow, yep. again in fluid dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, so I was using computers, but, but they were all dedicated to these experiments. I thought, well, maybe this technology is something I can use to build flight simulators and get my flying kick um, uh, through that route. And, and then I started building these things, and then actually the interest moved to the computers themselves, because mm. the technology had only just got to the point where, you know, somebody on a student grant could afford to buy enough stuff to actually build. Mm. Um, yeah, but it, although it, it was still quite expensive though. It was still quite expensive and some of these things, some of these chips were ordered from California. You know, shops in California mm -hmm. were selling to hobbyists. You could order them on a credit card. Right. Credit cards were fairly frightening. Uh, yeah. Uh, running on student budget. So yes, it was... A it, student with a credit card? It was not that common. I've heard of. <laughs> in those days. Um, but yeah, so, so the focus moved to the computer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but of course, in some sense, eventually, uh, through this and the next machine we're going to talk about and the BBC Micro, um, we eventually got to this, which I felt really sort of closed the circuit on my uh, 
on my flying ambitions, this is this is Aviator, which I thought was just a brilliant program. I mean, this oh, it worked. This did this effectively implemented my my dream about uh, eight years later, um, and I could fly this Spitfire. You know, I could do inverted loops under the bridge and things like that on on Aviator. So um, so this is a revelation. Is so your whole input to, to the microcomputers, the biggest background, it was all towards Aviator. Yeah, well, basically, Aviator, <laughs> Aviator gave me some kind of closure on, on, <laughs> on my original motivation. But of course, you know, by then I'd start. You know, I was working for Acorn yeah. uh, full time, and uh, my career since then has focused on computing rather than flying, mm. for better or for worse. Oh well, I'd, I'd say for better, but then I don't know what your flying was like. <laughs> um, so probably so not very good. <laughs> so, um, what, what kind of year was this? So that's an interesting question. Um, or well, years, probably. I think I probably started building this in about seventy-seven. Right. Okay. Um, I'm guessing that's 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 it. But my memory of when I started this and how long it was before Herman started talking about Acorn. Mm. My my memory's hazy. Time strange, isn't it? Yeah. Every, every, when we look at all this stuff, actually, the, the the time period that we talk about that is so exciting is actually <coughs> really quite a compressed time space. Um, it wasn't a long time between, you know, the, the, the peak of the home computer revolution as it was then and, and what went before. So yeah, um, thing, thing, seems like feels like a long time, but it really things wasn't. Had, things had, 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 you know, it started about seventy seven. Mm. We we, you know, picked up the vibes from the American computer hobbyist clubs. And mm -hmm. It was starting to happen in the UK, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> you know, by eighty three we were designing the ARM processor. It's only six years. Exactly. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, a very compressed time scale. Yeah. So can you remember when you took this into the uh, Chemist Process Group and and uh, for no. the first time? No. I can't. Did, did, did you say that, that Sophie was picking holes in the? Memory yeah. Puzzle? So 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 I, one of the modes of operation of the Process Group, apart from having sort of central meetings where we got speakers in. We also used to go around and meet in each other's houses, right. drink each other's coffee, uh -huh. and play with each other's machines, right? And, and, and I do remember I was living then at 7 St John's Road, which is a, a St John's College uh -huh. um, house for graduate students. And uh, Sophie was playing with this in the front room and said, you got memory bugs. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, that was the, the beginning of Sophie finding bugs in everything I do. So <laughs> Uh, but that works out to be a good team. Uh, there were some good things that come out of that. So that's fantastic. One of the things I do notice is the, the front panel and the attention to the to detail there. So oh, bear yes. in mind, this is kind of homebrew. Is that, that's letter set, isn't it? It certainly is letter set, yes. Yeah. Yes, this so was... That, that took some effort. I, I spent a long time doing similar things with, with front panels. Yeah. And the letter set not quite sticking right sometimes. And uh, It wasn't easy. I, uh, I mean, it's an aluminium panel, which, uh -huh. which I cut to size and made made the relevant holes in and the screws. I then anodized it in the kitchen sink, which I think meant sticking it in, was it sodium hydroxide? Uh, whatever it was, it wasn't nice. It was something, well, it, but it is something you use as a drain cleaner. Mm. So when I finished okay. with it, all it did was go and clean the drains as intended. And that gave the aluminium a, a, a more adhesive surface yes. than basic aluminium. Mm -hmm. Then I put the letter set on and then it was Sprayed with with letter set fixer, I think. Yeah, you, get, you, you do have to lacquer it. Yeah, yep. which, which which gave it a, a sort of layer of matte lacquer. Yep. Which which looks quite nice, and and you know it's still there, forty years later. Yeah. So it clearly works. Great little keypad on it there as well. This this, this is the keypad which you can see has been hand modified uh, to, to hexadecimal. Uh -huh. so, so the uh, A B C D E F keys are painted silver and letter set. <laughs> so the uh, the type font doesn't really match the other keys. So, so was this keypad off of something else, or was it just a generic keypad you could go out and buy? I really can't remember. No. I really can't. I don't think it was ever actually used. All right. Okay. Uh, likewise, these displays here, which are seven-segment displays, I don't think I ever used those. Um, I think I got the thing connected to a, a TV monitor and with a keyboard uh, right. quite quickly. So you had your own little monitor room in it. That where, could... where after, you know, it was keyboard and monitor right, and, and okay. all the rest of this stuff. It became uninteresting. Then we've got a really big linear power supply at this end. Two huge capacitors there. Transformer. Um, we've got an interesting little 9 volt, probably can't see that on the camera, but there's a little 9 volt um, battery clip there. <laughs> yes. um, what's all that about? That's a later hack. All right. Um, that was... Uh, 
I can't remember why it was being used as a prop for something that I, I by then the machine had been upgraded, it had, it had an operating system in it, it had a very boring front panel with just a keyboard connector mm -hmm. and a video connector at the side. But for using it as a prop, I thought it would be better to take it back to its more interesting initial form with switches and LEDs. Certainly uh, is. But I couldn't make everything, you know, I, could, I couldn't get it working in that form, so I, I cheated, put a 9 volt battery on there, <laughs> and then with that, you, you could flick the switches and various things would light up. <laughs> and it would, you, you have lights on, which is more interesting. Can't remember what, what it was you being used as a prop for? No, I can't. No, no. I, I really have no idea. Right, somebody's going to have to scour. But yes, it. it, it you know, switch mode, uh, I mean, linear power supplies were big. Um, a lesson we had to learn again for the BBC Micro. Um, it's got a healthy transformer. Mm. A, a lot of taps on that. Healthy bridge rectifier. Yes, I'm not using most of them, I don't think. Yeah. It's just 5 volt and 12, is it? Oh, no, you would need other ones for your April program It's probably as well. plus minus 5, plus yeah. 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's Sunday. like a homebrew tap on there as well. Yeah. It's into the... I don't know what that is. I, I think it may be because one of the connections broke, ah. and I had to find a way to uh, to get back into it. Uh -huh. and a huge heatsink at the back with a seven eight oh five H O five or something. Yep. I'm not a high power one. Those are on the inside, so mm. I can't actually see what see what they are. Um, Big T O three. They're no, not actually. actually, they're not actually, actually no. Those aren't T O threes. They're the N M three one sevens or something. They're, like they that? are the uh, smaller tab tab based. Right. Hmm. Um, well, that's fantastic. Linear power supplies, yeah. Well, so that, that's that's a, a fantastic addition to the collection. Thank you very much. It's going to um, go on display. If anybody ever gets this working again, I'll be completely staggered. I think See, that's <laughs> you know that's the that's a challenge. You know what you're doing there. Um, I do know what I'm doing. We yes. we have some fantastically uh, stubborn volunteers. Um, they're also quite clever, so we'll see. We'll see. Well, we'll have to find out if we can get data off the EEPROM for a start. We'll we'll read that out, um, and then start from there. Start, Will you? Okay. Start, start hacking reverse engineering from there. Yeah, I really, I really think this is this has been modified and <laughs> raided for components, uh, uh, probably well. an order of magnitude too many times for. We can but try. Breathing life into it to be a realistic prospect. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, even as it is, it's oh, fantastic. Although so. you could probably get the LEDs to light up with the 9 volt battery. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah, um, we could probably do that. Yeah. Um, well, uh, that sounds like a challenge to me. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so um, then we have another one here that looks suspiciously like um, like a System 3 or something like that from Acorn, but, uh, um, but it's not. No, no. This is this is about it. this is a homebrew machine, um, somewhat inspired by how Acorn went about building its systems. But I, I didn't use the same um, backplane bus connector. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a similar technology. So um, if I remember right, this this one is is the uh, is the main processor. Um, where we have now a trusty 6502 because that's where all the that. software fitted um, and a prom again this has been plundered for bits at some point um, that, so that's the, that's a processor card mm -hmm. and, you know functionally equivalent to the acorn system one processor card okay. um, with the same backplane technology as the previous one mm -hmm. and so, so is this is this before the Early Acorn systems, or kind of the same time but different, or I think this this is con contemporary with the Acorn systems, right. um, and it was used for for building various prototypes, some of which uh, were then transferred into Acorn, mm -hmm. and a lot of the ideas in this machine uh, formed the basis of the BBC Micro, so right. it, it had memory that was multiplexed uh, symmetrically between compute and video mm -hmm. use. And, and that's an idea that, that basically underpins the, the hardware architecture of the BBC Micro. Right. In here it was running at a, a more moderate speed, so I think it's a 1 MHz processor, 2 MHz memory, 1 MHz video. Right. In the BBC Micro those numbers were all doubled, mm -hmm. um, which turned out to be only just possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've heard um, stories about bringing in the memory yes. to, 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 to get it fast enough. So, but but um, here, of course, the, you know, the distances are greater, it's got a backplane, so, so obviously it would be slower than a single PCB yeah. 
implementation anyway. Yeah, you've got capacitance in the in the wires and and things. So um, so it's six five zero two, similar yeah. kind of build to um, the Signetics machine that you've just shown us there. Um, but it's not just a six five zero two, is it? No. Um, later on, I added a sixty eight oh nine. Looks very similar. Um, it's got its own software, and I think these these would talk nicely. You could run them both at once. Right. And, and I. To what end? I can't remember. No. I played a bit with sixty eight oh nine. The sixty eight oh nine felt like it was a significant advance on the sixty five oh two. It had it had more features, mm -hmm. but I think in retrospect, it didn't have enough more. Right. And and it and it wasn't moving to a sixteen bit architecture. So it wasn't enough of an improvement. Right. Okay. Um, and, and Acorn never really went that way. And the other feature I think that perhaps I should have highlighted on the 6502 card um, is it has an AM9511. That's an AMD floating point unit. Right. And I actually, um, again, while I was building this, I was a fluid dynamicist uh, research fellow, and I did some uh, some of my the fluid dynamics calculations using this machine. Okay. Uh, I can't remember the details. Um, yep. So that board's got some some RAM on it. Obviously, the the EEPROM there, FPU. It's it's um, it's, it's PROM. Yes, I think the, the the RAM is is in these boards. So, okay. So there are two identical RAM boards. boards. Okay. Two identical boards here, which I think have sixteen k of RAM each. Mm -hmm. um, there are 16 RAM chips, so that would mean the, these would be 8K chips, which sounds plausible. Mm -hmm. BBC Micro use 16K chips. 16K by one. Well, by one, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so these were kind of halfway there. I think that's right. I'm not. I'm not absolutely sure. Mm -hmm. We can have a look at the numbers. Mm? The, we can have a look at the numbers on the chips. Yeah, 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 yeah. Every it's statement too. should be checked for. <laughs> And I can't, can't for the life of me remember what these switches do. You know, they, may yeah. be, they may be right protecting you know, half the memory each, but... but um, right protecting the memory. I thought, that was a, I thought that was a bodge we did on the BBC Micros for sideways RAM, so that, um, so that your uh, illicit ROM image wasn't overwritten uh, when, uh, when you loaded in sideways RAM. No? But, uh, <laughs> possibly. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. If, if anybody you can check the wiring on that, maybe. If, if anybody can work time. out what I suppose you can, although the very wires impossible to physically trace, you can. No, just, maybe just buzz go it over out. the board with a with a bu yeah buzz out where it's connected to. Mm -hmm. Now, like I say, there's there's enough people involved in the museum that could uh, spend a little bit of time doing that and uh, uncover some truths. They better have more time than I do. <laughs> well, you happen. clearly had a lot of time at the time. Um, I mean, they're they're beautifully made. Um, Again, I mean, this is all. This is now using proper Vero rack, isn't it? So yeah, this is a commercial rack. Um, clearly, I felt I got my money at the time. Because <laughs> um, again, it wasn't cheap. I, I, I did some stuff with Vero rack, but it was kind of um, uh, half inched from my uncle's uh, company where he was developing systems. Um, so, but the actual stuff to buy from places like RS and stuff, it was really quite expensive. Was, at the time I looked at it, I thought, there's no way yes. I'll ever afford that. <laughs> it was quite expensive, but then, you know, floppy disk drives were expensive. Well, they were, they were. And, and this originally had two, as you can see. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the other one's gone. Um, it's, it's another linear power supply. Uh -huh. um, so what's this bit over here, then, on that's, the speaker? That, that's some kind of audio uh, system. Mm -hmm. um, you can... Um, you can feed audio in and you can get audio out. I don't think there's much hardware behind it. No, it's still way. screwed in. It's still screwed, so still why, screwed together. So it? why do you have audio on it? Did you need that for fluid dynamic? No, no, that was, that, was, that was a different use. Was this use. fun? This was fun, yes. Oh, the, the, other, uh, that's right, the other use of this, this machine is I wrote my PhD thesis on it. Okay. And, uh, so it was a word processor as well then? Well, I, before I could write my PhD thesis, I had to write a, an editor, which which actually sort of sounds crazy, doesn't it? Morphed into the BBC Edit and, and Twin programs oh. over you know, with with a lot of input from other people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I do I do remember this editor was a little bit scary. It, it, it was an editor which you know had a had a buffer that contained the text and a second buffer that contained the, the change file. Right. And there was no t no check for overflow on the second buffer. So if you were writing a change, if you went one character too far, the whole thing that was died. It. That was it. 
So you had to be careful. <laughs> and and um, it's okay if you know that. In order to print it, I had a parallel cable, I think, between one of these connectors and an LSI 16, which was the machine in my office. Mm. And I could convey the text across this parallel cable, and then I could print it on a twin track daisy wheel. You remember daisy wheel printers? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, got them in the museum. Very simple technology. Mm. Um, spinning wheel with, with all the characters, the ends of the petals, and then just careful timing. You throw a hammer a at little, the right yep, one. Yep. And mine was twin track because I had quite a lot of Greek, being a somewhat mathematical right. thesis. Okay. And, and uh, so I had two heads which would rotate back and forward. So my thesis, I think I was one of the first to generate a thesis on a computer. Right. At that stage, most people still wrote them by hand yeah. and then gave them to a secretary to type. And uh, my, my thesis came off as about 300 feet of continuous paper out of this daisy wheel, which I then had to slice up and <coughs> put together. Impressive. I, I didn't know there was a, uh, a daisy wheel actually that had two heads on it. I hadn't seen that one. But, um, yep. well, okay. Well, the engineering department had one or two of them. Oh, that actually. Maybe it was in the maths department. Yeah. Mm. Well, so then we've got the, the, the keyboard up there. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's, again, that's a sort of, that's a commercial keyboard unit, but mm. in a, I put it in a box. And there's probably some interface electronics in there. I don't know, I haven't looked for a long time. Um, and that. Yeah, ju judging by the number of wires, yeah. Yeah, the, the yeah. will be sort of, sort of an eight bit output from it. Yeah, what I don't know is if it, if it's if this is in any way similar to the BBC Micro, which which basically uses software scanning, mm. and mm -hmm. that that plugs in there, the right way up. Fantastic. And typically, I'd I'd have um, I had a little Hitachi nine-inch monochrome monitor, mm. which would sit on the top and feed off that, mm -hmm. and, and, and and that was basically how this machine was used. So this is the graphics part of it. You've got, was it a yeah. six, eight, four, five yes. chip in there? The well, same as on the BBC Micro. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, you know, I, was, I was using quite a lot of Acorn software on this as well. So I think it, it, it will run an Acorn basic and... Well. And uh, I also ran Lisp on it, I seem to remember. Uh-huh. No idea how. <laughs> Have we got any software that was on it, or is it just the, the hardware? I'm not aware that I've still got any software no. that ran on it. Okay, well, well, if you find any discs, with, I do have, probably with no labels on. I do have a few boxes <laughs> of, of uh, five and a quarter inch discs that, uh, well, that's, that may have something germane on them. Right. It's always hard to tell. Yeah, well, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, that, that is... That is absolutely brilliant. So we, we have here really sort of the, the genesis of, of the, the BBC Micro, um, going from the... So, so is that you, the, the, the Signetics machine, that, is that your first, absolute first sort of yes. attempt at creating any kind of... Yes, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at you know, my, my hand-built computer history, mm. then it's these two machines. Right. But of course, they're not just, I made this, then it worked, and then I made this. Mm. Both of them were were machines that evolved over time and got new functions. Yeah, and yeah. Then got plundered uh, for bits to build yeah. the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so neither of them is a single machine. Um, they, they've each been through a number of phases. Various iterations, yeah, yep. And, the, and I mean, the technology at that time was, was, was particularly amenable to this kind of hobbyist mm. approach. Uh, you know, it's almost impossible to do anything like this now because with uh, you know, gigahertz clock rates, yeah. Very wide just isn't. Uh... That's true in terms of in terms of the sort of the current technology for processors and things like that. But one thing that that I do remember. So so my background is is also sort of electronics and, and software probably equally. Um, kind of I worked at a company that that um, designed computers that fed cows. Not entirely what I thought I'd be doing coming out of school. Um, but because it's a small company, you get to do the hardware and then you get to do yeah. the software. Yeah. And it's all part of the same thing. And then you get to write the manual and everything else. Um, but it was actually really hard. You know, the, the, the components were relatively expensive, so, you know, my boss was always on the back to use the cheapest components you can get out there. Um, and, uh, and the technology, I remember at a certain point, we were uh, working with RFID tags. Texas Instruments had this module, big old lump of electronics. Um, it had an RF part to it, and it had the, the processor part underneath. Um, and again, to get the cost down, because it was about £380 for this module, um, he said, well, we can do the digital part, can't we? We can replace their processor board with ours. So we had a go at that, and that was kind of 
scary for me at the time, but it was about saving kind of hundreds of pounds on these things. And what I've found more recently, so that that was sort of late eighties, uh, early nineties. Um, there is so much stuff out there now that is so incredibly cheap. Arduinos um, and yeah. all these boards and these little interfaces and things. Um, so the, the same, effect, effectively the same RFID tags out there now is about 14 pound from eBay for the reader and 12 pound for a hundred like, credit cards which have got these tags in them. Um, so now we're using those so we have a, 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 a PC all in bits and you can pick up the different parts and put it on top of a, a target and the screen tells you what this bit does. But the, the two parts that I was working with to try and get cheaper are, are, are just a few pounds now. Um, so I kind, of, I kind of get angry in a way that kids have got all this stuff um, that is out there that is so, so cheap. Um, yet they're not really doing what I think they should be doing, you know, they're taking an interest in, in the electronics and, and that side of things. Um, whereas back then, this stuff was relatively expensive and actually really quite hard to, to get to grips with. We didn't have the internet, so there was no sort of looking up to find out how you solve this problem um, no. from another angle. And of course, that was one of the great advantages of the Cambridge University Processor yeah. Group, is that you didn't have the internet, but you had the other members of the group. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I remember... Uh, spending quite quite some hours and in this system with I think Emrys Williams, who was one of the founders of CUPG, came round and helped me get this 16 megahertz oscillator working. Right. Uh, this this was a bit beyond you know I, basically a mathematician, so, mm. so logic's easy, but getting oscillators to oscillate is, mm. is kind of is is you know real electronic engineering yeah. and yeah. Uh, it wasn't my forte. And again, that was interesting because we ended up doing it by using the capacitance between two adjacent pads on the, on the Vera board as, as, as a component in, in the oh, oscillator. Really? <laughs> wow, that was some fine tolerance. Yeah, yeah, it was... Uh... But as I say, the, the, the main point is you, you, you didn't have the internet, but you did have other people. Yeah, yeah, but, they, they, but they were a, a small group of people, and if you didn't have access to that, you were kind of on your own. Oh, and, yes, and you, yes. You were yes. You know, referring to the manuals all the time, and I, yeah, I don't know. It's just that I do think that... Um, People say that you can't do this sort of thing, and, and no, in, in terms of current technology, no, you're not going to build yourself a PC or a, you know, no. an iPad. But there is a lot of stuff out there that kids can play with and just get to grips with this whole stuff. Um, and of course, you know, Raspberry Pi and, and, and the BBC Micro bit have been yeah. very much playing into yep. that. I think, I think quite effectively. I mean, I think oh, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm impressed with, with, with where they and, and you know, before, even before that, there were PIC microcontrollers. Yep. Which were, oh, I spent a lot of time with PICs. With a bit of yeah, enthusiasm, fantastic. you could buy a PIC kit from Maplin's for mm -hmm. 20 quid and mm. go and make something work. Yep, yep, no, that's true. Um, yeah, there is a lot out there. It's just we're trying to get, um, well, the museum, like you know, is trying to get kids engaged in, on more the electronic side of things. Um, I think uh, we have a, sort of a strong lean towards that. Um, but but that's this is fantastic. Um, I, uh, thank you very much for for the donation. It's an important part of our collection now, um, and uh, they will be cherished. So, right, good Can stuff. I say the, the the last time I actually had this connected and powered up, it worked. Now that is probably twenty years ago, but I I, I think there's a reasonable chance that you can. Well, it hasn't got a switch mode power supply, so the, the uh, metalised <laughs> capacitors aren't going to explode on us. That's a, that's yeah. a good start. But it's a reasonable but, um, chance you'll be able to breathe life into that one. I okay. Guess. So that, that's a much easier job than, than this one. Well, we'll start with that one first yeah. then. But yeah. um, no, that's fantastic. Really appreciate that. And I think it should come up and say something Acorn-like, you know, because I think the operating system in there is... Oh. It doesn't say Steve's computer or anything like uh, that. Oh, come on. Probably says BBC Moss or something. <laughs> well, I mean, so bear in mind there is no there is no proton. Um, this is the closest we have to <laughs> the, the prototype of the BBC Micro. So yes, um, fantastic. So um, come and see it at the uh, the museum uh, in the near future. Um, there's a there's a couple of other things that uh, you've got as well that uh, are, are fantastic. Um, can you just tell us about this thing? That thing? Yeah. So I have never seen this. So this, this thing um, was given to me, I think, by the BBC in the very early days of the BBC Micro. And it's a, a number plate badge. Um, I can't quite see how you take it apart and get it together, I think. Oh, I just, yeah, okay. That. And the idea is you stick it on the front of your car. Um, yeah, anyway, so I've never attached it to a car, so it's... Have you not? It's pristine. Why not? Sure, you of all people should have that in their car. <laughs> well, you, you actually need something quite fine to make that work, wouldn't you? It's, uh... 
Um, yeah, possibly. Maybe that, I, I have just never seen. Maybe that's not. Maybe maybe the idea is that you you attach the plates to the car using bolts or screws or something, and, and then you just use that as a mount. Mm, maybe I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm just not quite sure who would who would put it on the front of their car and quite for what reason. Um, that would be one strong allegiance to the BBC uh, Micro. Yeah. Um, to have it in your front of your car, but it's it's fantastic. <laughs> Copyright BBC 1983. 83? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so there you are. Yeah, well, um, that's <coughs> absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I have never seen that at all. I thought I'd seen most things um, BBC microcomputer related, but there you go. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, the, um, we, we've got a, a number of other bits there. Um, you've got the, the Apple Newton. Um, the board from a museum, which is fantastic. Uh, various bits of um, documentation. So, and uh, oh yeah, the, the very the very first arm test board, naked, printed circuit board, never used, Cle clearly never used. Uh, we we populated one of these, and I think we had to do something about the power supply to get it to work. But um, this is what we brought the first arm chip up on. That's a that's a moment in time in itself. Yes, yes. This this was the board that generated this story that's gone around a lot about. You know, when when we when I first started to measure the power of the arm, I you know, wired an ammeter into the power supply, and mm -hmm. switched the thing on, got it running a program, went to look at the ammeter, and it said zero. It was drawing no current, mm -hmm. and it turned out this was because I hadn't actually connected the power supply. So, so is but, that a fault on this board? But, but, it, or was was running, it, but it was running a it was program. Running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was executing code without power connected. Yeah. And of course, the, after a bit, we worked out that, that, that it was just drawing power from the inputs that were at plus yeah. five or whatever the voltage was. It probably was five volts then. Mm. And, and through the protection diodes, yeah. and that was powering the whole chip. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it really was a low power chip. It really was, yeah. <laughs> but, but you weren't really... I mean, you were trying to make it low power for commercial reasons, you know, less heat sinks and cooling required in the, the machine, but you weren't really going for mobile computers. We were, no, 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 it was, it was for Acorn's desktop mm. product range. And, and uh, the, the motivation to keep the power down was that um, if it was under a watt, you could use a cheap plastic package. Mm -hmm. If it went over a watt, um, much over a watt, you'd have to use the ceramic package and uh, they cost, you know, plastic package 50 cents, ceramic package $20. Mm. Yeah, and um, the tools we had to actually predict the power um, were not very uh, reliable, and so we just sort of used Victorian engineering principles. And when we measured it, it was running at under a tenth of a watt. Mm -hmm. So the plastic package was no problem; no heat sink required. Fantastic. So, so was the um, power supply problem just a, a wiring problem from outside the board, or yeah, was there I a just, fault on the board? I just, I just messed up connecting it. Right. I, mean, I just failed to make the last connection. So, <laughs> um. and then we've got a, a, a BBC Micro bare, bare board there as well. Um, yeah. So, that's interesting. Somebody out there might know the reasons why. Um, I've already asked you, and you don't know. I hadn't realised um, this was as interesting as you think it well, is. Well, so. I mean, <laughs> that, maybe it's not. But I haven't seen an issue C. That's all. Um, you know, they were numbered. And uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things that are interesting about it because it's kind of like a, an issue seven. We have S39 at the top there, which um, uh, turns the composite video output to be color um, and therefore a little bit slightly fuzzier. Um, but yet it's, uh, so, so it's quite issue seven like, but it's issue C. Uh, so it's obviously after issue seven, maybe. Um, I don't know, maybe at that time, I mean, Acorn boards were being used in lots of things that weren't computers as such. Um, they were put into things like CNC lathes and all sorts. Um, so I'm just wondering if it's if it was for a, another another kind of project. I don't know. Aha, uh -huh. not the faintest idea. Well, there you go. That's I mean, there for... were there were things. I mean, there was the Acorn Cambridge workstation, wasn't there, which was yeah based on a 32 or 16 second processor on a BBC Micro motherboard. The one we have though, I'm pretty sure has an issue seven board in yeah. it. Yeah, I think. I have to go and check that now. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It may, maybe it's it's nothing, but um, well, I don't no, know it is idea. something. I have I, no I'd idea. like to know. I'd like to find out. So I if can, anybody on the internet knows, <laughs> please do let us know. Um, there's a lot of people with a huge interest in Acorn, um, so somebody out there will know. Maybe Chris Turner knows. I don't know. 
you can ask him. So um, anyway, um, yeah, well, I can't say thank you enough. I've, I've, I think my legs have been shaking because I've um, been quite excited. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic donation, so uh, we really, really do appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Well, drive carefully back to Cambridge. <laughs> I will. I'll be <laughs> half the speed I come up here. You're welcome, Jason. So thank okay. you very much. Cheers. Really appreciate it, Steve. Thank you. Cheers.